Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next session of uh, uh, Urban Church Planting. So let's just do a quick review of uh, what we did yesterday, and then uh, we'll get into today's class. So yesterday, we let me just present the notes. This makes, us, makes it easier. Okay, all right. So yesterday, we talked about the Holy Spirit uh, being our leader. Uh, we talked about uh, being dependent on the Holy Spirit on all our efforts. We labor and uh, God gives the increase. We talked about eternal fruit uh, and uh, how it requires wisdom to take on a city. And uh, some of us also shared on some of the challenges and struggles that we may face or have faced uh, when it comes to both uh, depending on the Holy Spirit as well as uh, executing things uh, that God speaks to us uh, through wisdom, right? So we also looked at uh, uh, the objectives of church planting. We saw that there's an establishment of uh, a community of believers, self-sustaining, uh, self-sustaining in terms of leadership financially and community. So let's move on to the next chapter, chapter four, God's heart for cities, right? Uh, so now God identifies himself with the city in, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 30, 35. Let's just quickly read that. Matthew 5, 35. Now, uh, Jesus is just uh, delivered this great sermon, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, uh, in Matthew 5, 35, that's what he says. Uh, let's read it. Uh, is it Matthew 5? Yeah, Matthew 5, 35. Right. Or by the earth, for it is your it is his first tool. For by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now, imagine God identifies himself as a city. Now, even when you look at, you know, you did a little bit of end times last uh, so we studied end times and we look at how God identifies people, he identifies situations, he identifies with uh, different kinds of communities. And you see in the book of Revelation, he says, he talks about Babylon, he talks about Israel. Uh, and we know that it's not literally Babylon or Israel, he's talking about uh, 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 the, the people involved there. So. God is identifying himself with a city. He's saying the city of Jerusalem. So what does it teach us? God has a heart for cities. And so sometimes we have this picture like, okay, God has created the world and he loves the whole world, yes. But here's the interesting part. God identifies with the, with the city and he cares for each and every city in his own way. Right? So what happens in each city is seen by God. And he knows what is happening. Right? Uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 18, uh, 20 to 21, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, this is you know just the beginning of nations, right? Genesis 18, just the beginning, right? It's uh, there were not too many nations. Uh, Let's read that, Genesis 18, 20, and 21. Any one of us can read. Go ahead. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because the scene is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against his that has come to me and if not i will know thank you so much right it says here now abraham is praying for sodom and gomorrah right and abraham pleads for this city of uh, sodom and gomorrah because what's happening is they have been living in sin they've turned their face against god and it says here that the lord said the outcry against sodom and and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin is grievous. So what does God say? God does not say, 
okay, so I'm going to abolish them, abandon them. He says, that I will go down and see what they have done. So what does it say? It says, I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. So God is not saying, okay, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, we don't need you. We'll just uh, clear up this place. We'll finish it off. And let's only just stick with the nations that are obeying God or obeying and following his law. No, he doesn't, he doesn't say that. Right? Uh, what happens in each city, God cares for it. God sees it. Uh, look at the next example, Nineveh. Uh, uh, this is a wonderful story of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1 and verse Let's read actually Jonah 4, 10 and 11. So that will give us a better idea. Jonah chapter 4, 10 and 11. Go ahead. Anyone can read, please. Jonah chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Yes, would anyone like to read? Yeah, jo Jonah chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Thank you, John. So here, again, we know the story of Jonah. Jonah is, God is using Jonah. God said, Jonah, okay, pack your bags, go to Nineveh. Nineveh is, is filled with, uh, you know, sexual immorality. People have turned against me. Go to that city and preach the gospel. Preach about my goodness, preach about my judgment. And we know the story. Jonah said, no, I'm not going to go there. They deserve the punishment. But in the end, after Jonah goes and he begins to uh, preach and people started turning away from uh, from sin. It says here uh, in, in this verse 4, verse 11, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. Should I not be concerned about a great city like this? Now, Nineveh is a, was the capital of Assyria, right? And it is a pagan nation. There's, there's nothing godly about uh, the Assyrians, right? but God was God's heart was for that city. And now, if you look at, uh, I remember many many years ago we went to uh, in, in the nation of India. We went to this uh, place in North India. So those who are overseas, uh, let me just help you uh, to. Get a background of this place. This place is called Varanasi uh, in North India, where it is it is actually the hub or the center of all kinds of uh, you know gods and goddesses, and uh, it is a, it is a center of uh, a lot of sexual morality, idolatry that happens there. So uh, and so hundreds and thousands and thousands of people would come every year to visit that place. You've got the river Ganges flowing there, which they believe was the river of uh, life, river of healing. And so uh, it's a very popular destination, uh, not only a tourist hub, but it's a religious uh, sentimental value to uh, people of our nation. And I remember we went there, every street in every corner, there were there was so much of demonic work there and i remember telling myself how are we going to touch people in this kind of a atmosphere right this kind of a setting how how is it going to happen and the first time when i was there i was thinking to myself god how are you going to, how are we going to do this how are we? you know my heart was for the city but more than the people in the city my heart was god how you how are you going to do it Right? And I remember going back to the room that day and God very clearly ministering, saying, 
I am bigger than the city's problems and what we see there, right? Uh, and 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 it was it is from there that I began to understand that God has a heart for each city, each city, uh, whichever city, whichever nation we are in. God has a heart, uh, and He's he, it's never like uh, you know He should be on the world stage. Only then God is you know uh, interested in you. We can be a small city, a small town a small nation not even seen by others god is interested in that because god's hand is involved in establishing nations cities towns villages everything god's hand is involved look at jesus in luke chapter 19 luke 19 uh, 41 to 44 let's read that luke 19 41 to 44 jesus uh -huh. now he's finished more than a year of his ministry by the time he's at Luke 19, more than one and a half to two years or in the mid of his ministry. And what's he doing here? Luke 19, uh, 41 to 44. He comes to Jerusalem. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Right Now, actually, this was supposed to be a triumphant entry. And if you go up to the verses before that, uh, you know they were they were all clapping. They all wanted to honor him for for what he did, for what he's doing, his ministry, and uh, it was a triumphal entry. Right? He came uh, uh, into the temple uh, in a in a cold, right? And they brought down. They put their cloaks down, and and Jesus is walking, and they put their cloaks. They all start saying Hosanna. And he's going through the Mount of Olives and he's looking at Jerusalem. If verse 42, if you even if you even you had only known on this day that the, what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Verse 43, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you. And hem you on every side. So Jesus is speaking prophetically. He's speaking of what is going to happen. They will dash you on the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will leave, they will not leave one stone on another because you do not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now, why is Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem? There's a question there. Is it because there were no facilities in Jerusalem? Is it because there was no you know, prophets, or the, there was no, or nobody was listening to him. Well, what was why, why he he was born in Jerusalem. He he's been there all his life. He's never wept over Jerusalem before. But what is making him to weep over Jerusalem during a prime of his ministry? They are all celebrating his life. I think, you know, they're singing Hosanna to the King and they're putting those. He should enjoy the moment. But rather than enjoying the moment, he's crying. Why is he crying? He, it says there that because the people, he's not only crying, he's giving a prophetic word saying that not even one stone will be left unturned. And that's what happened when uh, the Romans came uh, later on and destroyed the entire temple and everything that was there. Uh, but he's crying because people did not recognize the time of God's coming. They did not recognize that he is the Messiah. Right. So I want to read this uh, open. Why did Jesus weep over the city of Jerusalem? Maybe you can share some more thoughts. Would anyone like to share? What do you think? What was one of the reasons? So why did Jesus weep over a city, especially during a time of a triumphal entry, during a time when he can just soak in the moment and enjoy. Why do you think he, you know, he wept over the city of Jerusalem? Uh, one reason could be, as you suggest, as you said, uh, they did not understand the importance of Jesus coming, and and he cares for that city. Uh, God's, as we said, God's heart is for the cities, and he cares for the city of Jerusalem. He cares for the people, and uh, when when they did not 
realize the importance of Jesus coming into that place. I think uh, that could be one reason Jesus left the city. Yes, thank you so much, John. Anyone else would like to share any other reason you feel that Jesus left over the city? Right. Maybe a question that we can ask is, are we able to weep over the city that we are in? Do we have a desire, a passion to weep? You know, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I have not really wept over the city of Bangalore, but I have wept over cities, I mean, meaning I really, I was really moved over certain cities that, you know, uh, earlier on we used to do a lot of our uh, traveling uh, to different, sorry, I'm just going to stop this presenting. Uh, we used to travel for different conferences and uh, different programs all across India. There were some, some of these cities that I went to when I saw people there just living a life that is so ungodly and so, uh, you know, not only ungodly, but there were, there, was, there were times that people, you know, they are, they are seeking a God. They're so religious, they're seeking. They may have a good heart, right? uh, but they're seeking the wrong, in the wrong places. Right? Now, how do we tell them? How do we go and reach out? Uh, you know, uh, so if we have to reach out to them, the, uh, the next question here is, why is it important for us to receive and develop God's heart for our city? Because if we do not have a heart, uh, we will not be able to push ourselves. We don't have a passion or a zeal in the city that we live in. We will not be able to, or, or any other city. We will not want to take a step further, or we will not feel like moving out of our comfort zone. Just a few points here. We must be interested in the well-being of our city and pray for our city. Jeremiah 29, 7 and 8. And we know the story of Jeremiah. He fervently, fervently prayed for Jerusalem. Now he's known as a weeping prophet. I just made some additional notes here. Uh, a desire and a passion for Jerusalem. Right? He he fervently prayed for the nation of, uh, his, uh, of the city of Jerusalem. Right? So even to a point that he was willing to be put into prison. Uh, but it didn't stop him from releasing those prophetic words over the nation of uh, uh, the city of Israel. Now, all of us know this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, right? Uh, for I know, thus says the Lord, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, right? Plans to give you a good hope and a good future. Now, do we know the context of that? That's very important. You know, this is a letter to the exiles. These people, the Jews, are living in 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 uh, uh, during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. They are living in uh, Babylon. They are in captivity, right? And in captivity, Jeruz uh, Jeremiah is praying for the city. He's saying, "Lord, bless bless Jerusalem. That's our city. We weep over this city." The, the reason that we are here is not because of anything else, because of our own sin, our own desires that took us away from God. And, and, and you know, we see that he's praying over the city, but he's also releasing a prophetic word. The people of Jerusalem are tired, weary, they don't have their own place. So God is, through the prophet speaking, saying, I have plans for you, to give you a good hope, to give you a good future, plans to prosper you. Right? And if you go on, it says that I will carry you. Uh, I will take you back to the city from where I brought you as exiles. So we must be interested in the well-being of our city. Even if you look at Nehemiah, why must Nehemiah break his head? I, he's, there, he's got a good job. He's enjoying his life. But, you know, when he heard the news that the walls are broken, it, it moved him. Now, that kind of a uh, 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 zeal or that kind of a uh, conviction is very important for us. Now, we are not asking for a conviction that is so big that we, you know, we can 
start doing street evangelism. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about it could be small things. Right? So, for example, you see that there are a lot of young people who are, you know, suicidal nowadays. You read the newspapers, you've got every day something or the other, right? Educated people, educated youth doing well in their studies, committing suicide. It's a spirit. And does it move us or is it just news? We need to ask ourselves. I think they to ask ourselves. And there could be many things that God can put in our heart. Right? It could be uh, against prostitution, drug addiction, uh, whatever it is. If God puts something in our heart, be interested, be passionate, and pray for that. Right? Look at the next point. God looks for intercessors for the city. He's looking for it. Why does God need intercessors? God can just do it in his way. But that's not how God designed it. Let's read Isaiah 59, verses 14 through 16. Again, Isaiah, during a time of captivity, Isaiah 59, 14 through 16. Yes, anyone can read, please. Isaiah 59, verses 14 to 16. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. Yes, thank you, Rosalind. See, uh, I, I just want to read a portion from uh, the same verse, uh, from the NIV version. Okay, It's really interesting. He says, he saw that, uh, 59 verse 16, he saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked out the salvation. So that means what God is, what is the meaning of appalled? Appalled means he was like, it is a, a mixed emotion of, surprised and upset right uh, an emotion of being surprised and upset he was appalled that not one person is praying for the city so what does it teach us god wants us to intercede for the city right sometimes i've written here don't feel insignificant now it's happened many many times where we can just be two or three people sitting in a small room in a house praying for a city as big as you know the biggest city it could be or or entire praying for an entire nation sometimes we may feel insignificant now the moment you we feel that just tell the devil that hey greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world because god himself is looking for intercessors. So if when we pray for the city and we pray for nations, God is hearing our prayers. So God is not saying, oh, only two people, only five people. I thought the whole church would come. I thought there'd be hundreds of people praying. No, it doesn't matter. Because here in Isaiah, there are hundreds of people, but he was appalled that not even one person is praying. Right? So develop a heart of interceding for the city some of the things that i personally do is what i do is i i take time uh, every week so i make a note okay so for this city i will pray 20 minutes now just put down five cities it could be in india it could be out of india i just put it down city or nations i put it down and i pray over it just pray and now what is my responsibility to pray the verse later on says, God will work it out. He will bring out his salvation. What's our responsibility? To pray. And so maybe you can do that, right? Ask God for a desire, uh, for a passion to, you know, you can start off by praying for your own city. And then as God puts uh, cities and nations in your heart, uh, pray for them and believe that God will answer your prayers, right? Next point, God reveals his plans for the city 
to his prophets. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, uh, God revealed his plans. God told Moses, I'm going to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. God told uh, Abraham, I'm going to take them back. I'm going to take them into uh, another time of exile. God told Daniel, it's going to be 72 years that these people are going to be here in bondage. Uh, all, all across, right? God, God has told his prophets what he is going to do. He revealed his plans. And so even as you and I pray, let God reveal his plans. Maybe he may give us strategies. He may give us ideas on how, where, when to reach out. Right? Uh, so be open to those as well. Amos chapter 3, verse uh, 3, 7, and 8. Let's read that. Amos chapter 3, verse 3, and then 7 and 8. It's a common verse. Amos chapter 3, verses 3, and later 7 and 8, Pastor. Yes, yes, yes. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Surely the Sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing His plan to His servants, the prophets. The, li the lion has roared, who will not fear? The Sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So we see that God is speaking to this prophet and saying, surely two people cannot walk together if they are, if they are not in agreement. One. Two. Whatever the sovereign Lord does, he reveals that to his prophets. Right? So for us to walk together with God, we must be in agreement with God. See, the, for example, we God loves the people of a certain city. Right? Let's take let's take a an example of the city of Bangalore, right? Where we are from. God loves the city of Bangalore. He loves the people. He has a plan for the city. But what if, you know, there, there's a lot of things that are happening here. There's traffic, there's traffic congestions, there is, uh, you know, there's lack of space, there's no parking space, there's so much that's happening. Right? Now, what if I keep complaining about the city? Oh man, the city is like this, this is what happened. You know, when are we ever going to improve? The government has been doing this. Nothing has been, uh, you know, nothing is improving in our city. All the same laws, the laws are not being put into effect. What if I keep grumbling over it? Now, God is saying you pray and bless your city, pray over your city, but I'm, I'm majoring on the minors, right? That is uh, the traffic, the weather, the people, the houses. That's all the minors. You and I must be in agreement and work together with God for what His plan is. What is His plan? That people, communities get to know about the gospel, that darkness be removed, that people's lives be touched, transformed, that churches begin to grow, that ministries begin to grow. That is His, his desire. But as believers, we are looking at the minors. And remember, God is much bigger than the city. Nothing is too difficult for him. So we yeah, are not to get uh, you know overwhelmed by the size, uh, by the magnitude of the of the problem, the depravity of the situation. Uh, address these issues to God. So you and I, as believers, we can pray against strongholds. We can pray against demonic oppressions. Right? Address the matters. As some so, so for example, if there are uh, over over a uh, you know over a city, if you see that you know, there is constantly maybe there's this drug addiction problem or prostitution, pray against it. Let's pray against it. Now, as you're praying, the enemy may make us feel, hey, you know, you're praying against prostitution, but prostitution is been there for the past uh, 500 years or, or more and it's only been increasing you're praying nothing's happening no 
God is looking for intercessors. Our responsibility is to pray, and the arm of the Lord will do His work. So don't get overwhelmed. Right? We must get God's heart for the city. We must learn to see people as how God sees them. Right? A heart for souls to be touched, a heart for souls to be added to the kingdom. Now, I want to differentiate here. There are two things. One, we can have a heart for souls to be added into his kingdom. And we can have a heart for souls added into the church, into your church or our church. Now there's there's a difference. Right? Now if I'm if I'm a pastor, for example, right, and I only want people to come into church, I don't have a heart for it for this city. But if I have a heart for people to get to know Jesus, to see their lives transformed, whether they are English speaking or any other language, whether they are in the city, going to another city. All that wouldn't matter. So be very clear in our in your objectives. I tell God, well, I will do the work of praying, ministering to people. People will come into church, people will go. Right? So it's not about that. The heart is to see people added into God's kingdom. Eventually, people will God will add people uh, into the church, leaders, everyone will come in. Uh, to serve alongside you but our objective should be clear because i can have a heart for souls to be added into the local church but not have a soul not to have a heart for the souls in the entire city i just want people to come to my church that's a wrong attitude right we must be moved with compassion for the people in our city we must pray for our city and you know, it's good that as a church, uh, a universal global church, we have we have recognized that we need to pray for our cities. I, uh, recently, I was just uh, reading a couple of articles, and the articles showed about the nation of the United Nations of America, right, the USA, how it's a Christian nation, but there is so much that is happening there. Uh, that is, you know, hurting God so much. And call it the pres present day Sodom and Gomorrah. Churches are growing, but people are, they don't know God. Right? Uh, and, and so we must pray. We must put our heart in and pray for these cities. Now, here's the interesting thing the rewards for this faithful service of praying. This present age results in authorities over cities in the millennium. So that means during the thousand year reign, if here we have been faithful and praying for our city, God can say, okay, you can look after this portion uh, and over of the city in Jerusalem during the millennium. Right? Imagine that reward. The Lord Jesus himself, right? You know, in the millennium, Jesus is coming, he be there. Oh, Jesus himself will say it. Right? Now, some of us may say, Oh, millennium, who's going to wait till the millennium? Right? This is just an additional point. Know that you know God will reward us for our efforts and for praying and being honest. The Bible itself closes in the book of Revelation with the holy city of Jerusalem, where the new heavens and the new earth comes in. Jesus himself is coming to be on this new world right so what we want to leave from this chapter is have a heart for the city even before you reach out even before you start your ministries even before you plan to plant churches plant ministries have a heart for the city if you don't have a heart sit sit in god's presence pray and ask God, God, give me a heart for the city. Or I'm going to another nation. Lord, give me a heart. So if you look at church history, you see these wonderful men and women of God. How were they able to do so much? So William Carey. Uh, nothing. He, he 
such an insignificant person, Charles Spurgeon, insignificant. They don't have great degrees in. But how are they able to come to a different nation? Have you ever thought of that? Right? Uh, coming to a different nation, starting something here, and and just doing such a great work that even now, years later, thousands of years later, we are talking about them. It's because they had a heart for the city. Right? So let's look at some of the natural dynamics of urban centers. Right? Uh, now, urban cities, how is it different from a village? Maybe we can just share our thoughts here. How, how is a city different from a village? What do you think sets a city apart from a village? And I'm sure we'll have a lot of thoughts. Would anyone like to share? A city and a village. What what, what differentiates us? Right. Anyone would like to share? Right. It's just the natural things, natural dynamics. Well, what what is there? The culture and practices. Okay. Okay. So, in culture and practices, can you share one or two points? Anyone else too can share. Feel free. Yeah, there is there is a lot of difference. Uh, there are cultural differences. Practices are different, but can we specify some of the things? Uh, mm. Life in cities are busy and fast paced, whereas uh, in uh, in the villages, it is a small settlement mm. and with a small group of people. Very true. Thank you, Zuri. Yeah. City life is fast paced. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I believe even the needs are different for the city and for the village. Because uh, uh, I've did some village ministries in the past four months, and uh, their practices are different, their lifestyle is different, and what they expect uh, also was very different. Even the needs change uh, from a city to a village. And sometimes even we have to change the way of reaching so that they can understand. And I believe there is a lot more changes than we could ever think about. Yeah, very true. So in a village, in a city, we may need uh, you know, our own house. But in a village, if they have one tree which gives shade, they're more than happy. So just an example, right? Uh, uh, so you see the needs are so different. Uh, Subhashi says intellectuals and influencers, if they can be reached, they have the capacity to reach other cities and nations as well. Okay. Yeah. One thing else. Uh, so if you look at villages, uh, you know, even, even when you talk about uh, social media and all of these platforms that are there, the usage is, of course, much, much lesser. Uh, and then you can also talk about the mindset, right? The understanding, uh, what kind of a mindset they have, the grasping ability. So, for example, uh, we, we can't go to uh, the village and teach about revelations. It's not going to help them, right? So, so we need there are there are different uh, mindsets. Their level of understanding also is very different. Uh, and so, there are many many differences between cities and villages uh, let me just you know, see. right so let's understand the natural and spiritual dynamics that prevail over our city okay so what are the natural dynamics the city history of the city is very important so we look at it, we say, okay, who was it? Why? When was it established? All of that. Then you got the political environment. Uh, the economy is very important. The economy is very important. Right? Uh, how's the, um, the the per capita of the economy? What is the, uh, you know, if the economy is good, 
you got better jobs, you got better facilities, you got people coming into the city, you got more work opportunities, more work is more income, more income is more tax, more tax is helping the economy. That's what now, obviously, in villages, it's not so. You work, you, you know, probably doing labor, and then whatever you sell that, you take that income, whatever profit you get, and you use it for your home. So it's not going to directly affect the town or the village, right? Then you got demographics, natural dynamics, age distribution, language, cultural backgrounds, senior citizens, young people. Right, so if you look at uh, cities, young people, we know that uh, you know the city of Bangalore is one of the highest uh, uh, Instagram users uh, in the world. I was so surprised to read that in the world, in the Instagram users. So that means what you got uh, probably five fifth standard, fifth grade and sixth grade kids. Were probably 10, 12 years old started to starting to use Instagram, and the demographics have changed. Right, you got socio economic issues, got education, people coming in for education. Uh, the education levels have changed. You know, when we were growing up, you got first standard to 10th standard, you get into a college, and then you get a job. But now you got so many things available, so many streams that are available. Right, so uh, distribution of educational systems, industrial hubs, women workers, employment, disabled population. So all of these are the natural dynamics. Right now, question: Why is it important to un for us to understand the natural dynamics of a city when planning to do a church plant or a church ministry? Why should I understand the dynamics? Right? I will go, I will start the church, and I will pray, pray for the city, pray for people. And God, you bring the people. Isn't that just enough? So, so maybe you can share, why is it important that we must look at the natural dynamics? Anyone would like to share? John, would you like to share? Okay. Sure, go ahead, Jatina. Yeah. Uh so I think even when we look at the life of Paul, uh, he wrote differently to Corinthians, differently to uh, the other cities that he went, actually. So the needs changes, uh, the people are in different circumstances. So I think basically we need that idea of how the city works, what's the background and everything, so that we know to preach uh, at their need. There's a verse that says, a timely word is so sweet to the heart. So I think that's one of the reasons uh, or else gospel is just enough. We don't need Corinthians. It's only other things. So from the life of Paul, that's one thing that I understood. He was Jews for the Jews, a Gentile for the Gentile. So that's one of the quality that I think we all should definitely have so that we can preach the word uh, in the right manner. Yeah, that's that's perfect. That's very good. Yes, uh, good example of the apostle paul wherever he went uh, all the churches that he started there were he knew the natural dynamics of the of the of the area so act 17 we do this in uh, light side evangelism where he goes to corinth athens and you know, he tries to figure out what kind of people they are what kind of uh, you know what is their belief system figure out the natural dynamics and i'm sure he did that even in the other churches that he, other places that he visited. And, uh, yeah, anyone else would like to share? John, would you like to share what are some of the, I know that, uh, so most of us may know John is uh, leading the church in Mangalore. So uh, John, would you like to share, like what are the dynamics that you probably noticed uh, that is different from the city of that you live in? and uh, now that you're serving in a different city, what what are uh, the, some of the natural dynamics that you had to, you know, learn over time? And others too can share if if you'd like to. You can also share. So. Would you like to share, John?
Anyone else would like to share? Hmm. Okay, Pastor. Yes, um, I just want to share my personal uh, point of view in this regard. Um, I'm from Kohima, and I recently shifted to Pune. So what I'm uh, uh, realizing is like uh, in the east, I live in the east, and the sun used to rise very early in the morning. By four, it's so bright. But here uh, in Pune, you know, four is still dark. And what we do in Kohima was we do ministry uh, during the daytime. But now here I'm realizing, you know, only in the evening, uh, most of the people are available. So we do house meeting, cell meeting, prayer meeting, everything is in the evening around seven, eight, and all those things. That's the difference I'm noticing. And it's good that I'm learning to adjust and I'm learning from here. Yeah. 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 Very, very important. Yes, definitely. Uh, so one, it, it, see, natural dynamics don't need to be super spiritual. Like, oh, these people are, it is a simple thing. Right? So Zeli is from Northeast. Uh, I remember when I went to Kohima, they came at uh, 4 a.m. with the breakfast. I was wondering why, uh, why 4 a.m. breakfast? But that's how it is. Right? This day starts off really early. And, uh, and so now when you come to a city like Pune in Mumbai or Bangalore, nobody has time in the day. We can go for house visits in the daytime because everyone are working. They get back home. And sometimes, you know, uh, practically we see Monday to Friday also, they would prefer to just be resting. So uh, they would prefer a Saturday, which is their day off. And then Sunday they keep it for family. And so that's how it is. Now we can't get angry and say you don't love God. Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense, right? So uh, these are practical things that uh, we must keep in mind. Anyone else would like to share? Uh, why is it important to understand the natural dynamics? And uh, so there are a few points here. Let's just go over this. When we understand the natural dynamics, especially before starting a ministry, we get a feel for the city as a whole. So we basically tend to understand, right? Okay, what will work? What may work? What may not work? What are the changes that you and I must make when we are you know, planning to start uh, a church or a ministry, right? Uh, and Secondly, this will help us to pray for the city uh, when we know the dynamics of the city. So you got some cities who are, uh, you know, they have this certain kind of problem, and then you have another city which is, as you know, uh, another kind of problem. So even as we are praying, we know we ask God to devil, give us a heart, uh, a heart of compassion towards the city, uh, and then this will allow us to. Well, I love God to place specific area of needs uh, into our hearts, right? So now each one of us, uh, you know, we have different kinds of uh, desires. We have different kinds of burdens that God puts in our heart. Now, not all of us can be a Mother Teresa because she did a brilliant work. God put that burden in her, uh, but not all of them can, uh, you know, uh, but she may not be able to do some of the things that others may do because God put burdens in different ways. So even as we pray for the city, we can ask God, uh, God, give us a burden for this. Right? And finally, it will be also important for us to develop strategies for the city. What kind of strategies are we going to develop to minister to the city? So it's very important, whether it's a city, town, village, uh, to get a feel of what's happening, understand the dynamics of the city, and that will help us. Uh, next week, uh, I'll just share about exploring Kabul and how uh, uh, launching APC Delakate, how uh, Pastor was able to, uh, Pastor and uh, a, a, a small team was able to start APC uh, Mangalore, Delakate, which later came to be APC. Right? All right, so let's stop here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just, Okay, thank you so much. Uh, have a great week ahead. Uh, we'll catch up next week. God bless. Have a good, good day, good evening.